well, tell you what, it was quite an honour to be asked to come and talk in this fantastic new building. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm still a bit nervous, so but I'll get going, I'll be all right. I'm going to join this man with a pint afterwards. <laughs> um, right, let's have a look. Yes, in the next 15 minutes, if I talk fast, or I'll be quick, all right. I'd like to take you all on a journey and tell you a story. It's a journey that Mavis and I have been travelling now for quite a few years. And the story is our involvement with asbestos, which most of you now will be familiar with, with the contamination and the ugly consequences of that contamination. It's a it's, as I say, a joint journey that we've shared. You're all familiar with sheets of asbestos, no doubt, and the contamination and the rotten consequences. So, I'm ready. If you're ready to join me on that journey, I ask you to take a seat on my magic bus, close your eyes, and I'll whip you back to where, for me, this journey began. OK, you can open your eyes because we've arrived at 1953, where, for me, this journey began. It was in the historic dockyard at Chatham. It started, I'm 15 years old then. I've just left school. I've just passed the entrance exam. And I've just gained a five-year apprenticeship in the Royal Naval Shipyard at Chatham. Most of that first two years was carried out in these old antique mast house buildings. We had two days a week at college where we had to do the principles of shipbuilding and naval architecture. And we had three days a week where they let loose on machinery and learning to use hand tools and some practical projects. At the end of that two years, we were transferred out of the training centre and we were put into gangs of shipwrights and assigned to a mentor. And that really was where my story starts. You might ask the question at this point, so what was life like for a young boy in a shipyard at that time? This is pre-health and safety, dare I say it. Pretty gruesome when I look back. A typical day for me at that time would be clocking on at seven in the morning and taking a walk down the dockside and we would have to climb over any amount of bits and pieces that had been ripped out of the ship and dumped to shore ready for disposal. It'd be small pipe work, big pipe work, trunking, ventilation, oh, fridges, engine parts, boilers, everything, all covered in copious amounts of asbestos. We'd walk up the brow, step on board the ship, and we'd be met with literally miles of hissing, spitting, leaking compressed air lines. And they'd be churning that asbestos dust-laden cloud into a haze that we'd work in all day long. Yeah, we would reach the area that we were going to be working in that day, and hang up your jacket and put on our overalls. But those overalls that have been hanging in that dust cloud all night, and we just start work, it's not a problem. And come home time, we'd swap back, put your jacket back on. But now that jacket's been hanging in that asbestos dust cloud all day. And you're gonna take that dust home and share it with your family. Working in those asbestos areas, something like that would have been very helpful. But unfortunately, all we ever got was a pair of overalls. A lunch break, the idea was you'd find a clean area on the deck, kick aside any big rubbish and simply squat. You'd open up your lunch box and pour out your cup of tea and get your newspaper out. 20 minutes later, when that hooter went to go back to work, that asbestos dust cloud would have been settled all over your cheese and tomato sarnie and on top of your cup of tea. 
So now you would have eaten it and drunk it. That cloud was everywhere. We're completing that first year on board the ships. We moved on into my full fear. We could have been in a new gang, the new shipwrights and a new mentor. But the only thing that wasn't new was the dust and the mess. That cloud was ever present everywhere. But as I moved off into my last and final year, a major change was going to smack me between the eyes and I had no idea at the time what it was. But it came in the unexpected shape of a girl that I'd just recently met. That major change was the quiet, shy and reserved Mavis. And those who know her know she ain't quiet, shy or reserved anymore. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed to say that it was love at first sight. We were inseparable and we met every single day after work. Sometimes at lunch times I'd get on my little old motorbike and I'd speed off to try and find her so that we could snatch ten minutes together. But when we kissed goodbye and me to get back to work, she'd have been breathing that dust in off my clothes. And the damage was then done and the clock was ticking. With my five years apprenticeship now nearing its end, I was about to enter another new phase that was going to smack me between the eyes. Not only with the government at the time quite happy to poison me on a daily basis with their asbestos, they now wanted me body and soul for two years national service. So exactly a week after signing off my indentures, they swapped my overalls for a hairy uniform and a pair of boots. I can't say, to be honest, that that two years in the services was the happiest two years of my life because, to be honest, they weren't. You might say, well, look, you look happy enough there. What are you moaning about? Well, I was happy there because that was my last day in Germany. I was on the mob and I was going home. At last, yep, yeah, I'm going back home. Yes, back to that filthy shipyard, and yes, of course, back to Mavis. But at two years' service behind me, now life can move on. They can have their boots back. And a few weeks after the mob, all those plans that we'd been building over the previous months came together, and we got married. We lived a normal life, settled down and raised a family. But now, Maybe says my wife was washing my dusty clothes, shaking them. I don't suppose anybody here has used one of these old-fashioned washing machines, have they? No, I didn't think so. Well, everything had to be shaken before they went in, so she was breathing in more dust off my clothes. And as I say, tick-tock, tick-tock, that clock is still ticking. Sometimes I'll get sent a little video and I thought this two minute clip is my favourite. I don't know whether some of you may have already seen it, but I, it's my favourite, I love it. Just enjoy yourself. Be yourself, yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, look at me, not at the camera. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, Jenny, would you consider it important to wear a dust mask in the working environment? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about health and safety. <laughs> um, no, um, they're a good idea. Uh, they can be a bit fiddly to put on sometimes, and if you want to talk to someone, you might forget to put it back on afterwards. Um, but, uh, no, um, they're helpful, I'm sure. <laughs> Do you wear a mask in dusty working environments? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of the time. Well, sometimes. Um, I actually find them quite uncomfortable. And have you noticed any impact on your health over the last five years? No, not really. I mean, some of the other lads, they cough a lot, but, you know, they're probably on like 40 fags a day or something. <laughs> Outside of work, would you say you lead a healthy lifestyle? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I eat pretty healthily and... I like having my friends around the house, but... Uh... Where do you see yourself in 10 to 15 years' time?
Does that ring any bells? You're all too young yet, aren't you? So after my two years in the service was up, and I realised that going to work every day did not have to be in those filthy shipyard conditions. And I decided it wasn't the place for me and I was going to find something else. 18 months passed while I searched. I took on many roles. We raised a family, as I say, and lived a normal life. And eventually I settled on a completely new path. I retrained in electronics. And to me, that was a white coat and a clean room job. And all thoughts of asbestos were now long gone. But time catches up, and that year, 2000 was approaching. And it was a point where some of us looked forward to in life, retirement. We were ready to live the dream. We had a small motor home, and we were travelling around, touring about, up and down Britain, having a great time. Eight happy years passed that, uh, before that dream was to turn into a nightmare. Christmas of 2008, we were fed up with the cold, miserable winters and we decided we needed to look for some sun. So I packed all our bits and bobs and I drove that down to Spain. We were now looking for some nice sunshine. A couple of months down there touring, we had a great time, didn't we? But all things come to an end and we had to come home. But as soon as we got home, Avis was having problems, all sorts of strange problems. She had several visits to the GP and a couple to different specialists, but nothing was confirmed. But I remember it well. It was the 4th of June. 19... 2009. 2009. That's how well I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it was our wedding anniversary. We were going up the road to vote. And Mavis suddenly collapsed. She said, I can't do this. Take me home. I can't breathe. So a very, very slow walk home and a quick phone call to our GP. And he was good. We got in to see him straight away. And he checked her over and was checking his PC. And he said, right, go home. I'll give you a phone call shortly. Well, we got the phone call. He said, there's a bed waiting for you at Kent and Canterbury Hospital. Now, get yourself in. So, off we went. It was a couple of weeks that had kept her in there and I was visiting every single day and they were carrying out all these different tests, uh, scans, CT scans, or, or you name it, growing cultures in dishes and eventually during that one of my visits the doctor came up with the great news. He said, you got mesothelioma. We couldn't say the word. What's, what is it? What, what, have you, what is it? He said, it's an asbestos related terminal cancer. There's no cure and no treatment that I can give you. Go home and put your affairs in order, he said. And his prognosis for that, you've got three months. Can you imagine? I'm sitting on the end of her bed trying to make sense of what this doctor has just said. Terminal? Cancer? Three months? But the word that stuck in my brain at that time was asbestos. Asbestos. Yeah. This was my old apprentice days coming back to haunt me. This is my fault. I gave this to Mavis, and this is my thanks to her for half a century now, nearly, of love and devotion. A bloody death sentence. How am I ever going to deal with this? I don't know. And to be honest, that was ten years ago, and that guilt still sits on my shoulders today. 
But a few weeks later, there was a little glimmer of hope offered on the horizon. We had a letter offering a course of chemotherapy if we were interested. Maybe you said, well, I'm going to die anyway, so yeah, let's, let's go for it. That was the start of four long, sick years of various types of chemotherapy. And as her carer, yep, I was learning to cook. Not a very good one, I must add. But you can't live on beans on toast forever, so I had to make an effort and learn fast. I found all sorts of things in the cupboards at home. I found brooms, dusters, tins of polish, you name it. I also found this big white tin box in the kitchen. And Mavis said, if you put dirty washing in there, it comes out clean. Technology today is amazing. I had so much to learn. But after four years of chemotherapy, they called us in and she, the oncologist said, I've got to stop all treatment for you because your body is now so toxic, it's so full of poison that it's killing you. As if the cancer wasn't anyway. But, uh, She'd been reduced now to relying on a walking frame, standing up, walking about, getting anywhere was no longer an option. Because if I didn't keep an eye on her, she'd be flat on her face or flat on her back somewhere. But, uh, she was in a real bad place and they were now measuring her future in weeks. But during one of her many presentations that she was advised that there was a small trial beginning at the Royal Marsden and it was immunotherapy and it might just do uh, mesothelioma some good. So we asked our doctor for a referral and yeah, we got one. Good old Professor Bono, lovely man. They responded, we had to wait for the response and yeah, there was three places available on this trial and Mavis was fortunate enough to get one of them. But there we are, we leap forward now to May 2016 with the treatment that we had every 14 days for two years, 52 drug infusions, that trial was completed and we had to sit back now and wait for the results. That result was complete response. And in layman's terms, that means remission. And this was the best news that we'd had in seven years. And during all this time, did she sit at home moaning with a woe is me attitude? No, that's not Mavis. Despite her illness, she runs a social media network called the Miso Warriors. It is recognized globally and the hard work that she puts in is just beyond me. I don't know how she does it, but she has on average of 20,000 plus hits a week, which she deals with. It's amazing. She was awarded a British Citizens Award for all this hard work. And at the moment, I can't rein her in. I can't slow her down or stop her. <laughs> she has her own registered charity now, the Mavis Knife Foundation which was registered in April 17 and it's it's coming along it's doing quite well but there we are look what a journey 62 years together still smiling long gone that quiet shy and reserved girl that I met all those years ago and long gone my hair as well but that's life but that's not quite the end of this journey we were still smiling up to April of last year, but then things began to change. We were having regular checkups every eight weeks at the Marsden, and we travelled in for our scan results, and we left that meeting with devastating results. Some new tumours had emerged, and the mesothelioma was back again. After consultation with the Royal Marsden, they agreed that we could go back on the trial again. But at this point now today, with those latest results, Mavis has asked me to shut up, stop waffling, 
because she wants to explain to you those latest results because she knows and understands it better than I do. So thank you for listening to my part of the journey. I hope it's been of some interest to you. But it's time to do as I'm told and to invite Mavis up to take my place. And I always do as I'm told, don't I? <laughs> thank you. So yeah, this is my side of this uh, journey, as he calls it, that's been going on for 10 years, although the actual journey has been going on for 50 years. We'll be, marri we'll be married 50 years next year. 60 years. Sorry, 60 years next year. <laughs> 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 so it's finally gone quiet. So now I can say about the scan results, I, d I didn't want to go too technical because you're all in the building and not in the nursing side of this. But the actual thing is that I'm now the first person um, I was the first, uh, there was only three of us and the other two have uh, died uh, and this was immunotherapy came on the scene and which you now hear of because immunotherapy is doing really really well out there on all sorts of cancers because they tested it on 28 cancers at the time and although this has grown back um, and they've uh, lucky enough I had it that it was written I could have it for the drug for another year it, the, what surprised them was that they thought that uh, the drug would have that uh, it would have a memory and so if the cancer cells came in, back in again it would go in and kill it um, but I've proved them wrong which is what I'm doing all the time I keep asking questions and they keep saying don't ask up don't ask us the questions we are waiting for you to tell us so I'm now the first person in the world to re-challenge the drug which uh, it worked for four infusions and I had 14% shrinkage um, and then the, the cancer gets crafty and it hides or it turns itself and, uh, and it, um, everything changes and it starts still carries on growing. So um, the scan, the latest scan I've had and I had the results on Monday is that it's still growing, only a little bit but it's growing, the cells are beginning to multiply. So they had done a biop and they've looked at my DNA and they've matched that DNA up to another drug, which is actually out there for ordinary cancers, sorting out ordinary cancers and isn't for mesothelioma, so they're gonna try it on me because it does match my DNA. So that's my next step and that's where I am today, waiting to see for the next scan. If it's still growing, then I will go into this. And it's a highly intensive thing that, I, they're putting it with Pembro uh, which is Keytruda, that's the name that everyone knows, Keytruda. And um, they're going to put it with that, but in actual fact, I go three times a week. Oh, four, you're saying four times, but I say three. I'm sure I have three. <laughs> um, if three t if every three weeks, I've got to go in for four days and they've gone uh, for this drug, this new drug that they inject into you rather than give it in the infusion. So we'll see. All I can do is keep going and keep hoping because then I can be here talking to you still. So this was it, you know, I've had a normal life. No thought about spastus, or my, although my dad became, he couldn't breathe. He worked in the dockyard, he was in submarines and he couldn't breathe and he did die eventually of what everyone said was asbestosis, but in actual fact we think it's a mesothelioma because he, the symptoms he had, I've got. So um, this is my scan, this is actually my scan, and it, although that's the heart there, it filled up with fluid and they drained off uh, seven litres of fluid and then another two litres. Um, so that's what happens, your lung collapses and that's why you can't breathe. And in 2014 I started this new trial and the lovely staff down there, they're just brilliant. But then I found that all lung, cancer, uh, lung cancers and the nurses are just wonderful. And you get treated, because you're on a trial, you're monitored better. So I like being on a trial because I feel I'm really looked after. Um, it's, and you, I come out here, like Ray now has got lymphoma, and I find that the difference in the treatment he's getting to what I get on trials is far better. So I always say go for trials if you do get in the same, well, I hope you never do. <laughs> and so um, they brought out this new uh, vein finder, which is brilliant. And so I'm 
because what I had, I had sepsis from the um, pick line, and uh, I've, so they had to cure the sepsis up, and that's why right at the end, I, my, I'm not in the last report uh, with Merck about, um, because I, I missed it. And so, but I should be there as complete response, and I'm not. I'm listed as, um, I don't know what it is, just, oh, just, ongoing. just ongoing, wasn't it? Yeah, and I should be there as complete response because my original um, mesothelioma is lying there and it's in complete response. It's just this new growth. So somewhere the asbestos keeps growing in different parts of your body and it and the cancer just is crafty, really. So um, I started running the Miso Warriors on Facebook, but the times that I have to light that candle, it, it's devastating. I've, I've lit it about sort of seven times in the last few weeks. Um, winter, it, they, they sort of get a, um, uh, an infection, we get our coughs and colds, and they get their pneumonias, and they go far quicker, although we've just lost a darling doctor she is the doctor of HIV and um, yeah 44 years old with two little kiddies she's gone just like that she on Saturday she was messaging me Sunday she goes into the hospice and Monday she's dead you know so it's so awful it, it's just and it's so preventable because asbestos is a preventable disease so sometimes a video comes along and it says it all Silica. It's one of the most common substances on Earth. It can be found in materials like sand and rock, and building products like concrete and brick. When a worker cuts, grinds, or drills materials that contain silica, dangerous crystalline silica dust is released into the air. <coughs> As the worker breathes, silica crystals flow into his mouth and nose and down the air passages deep into the lungs. The tiny crystals enter the small, fragile air sacs where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells, called macrophages, engulf and try to dissolve the crystals, but they are unable to. Over time, more and more crystals build up inside the macrophage cells. The macrophages carry the silica into the walls of the lung, where they die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more cells die. This damage can continue even after the exposure to silica stops. Eventually, so much scar tissue forms that the lungs can no longer function. I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to say, look after your lungs, protect yourselves. You know, because it's not just asbestos, it's dust, silica, and you know, and even right down to nanotubes even now, but it's, you can protect yourselves. Get your face masks. See, because it's dust is everywhere. So buy, get your face mask and be face fit tested and look after those lungs. And if you've got a beard, shave it. <laughs> it you lose your, you know, you lose it there, don't you? You lose the, um, seal. the seal, yeah. So look, I mean, they do such stupid things. They take things off and they go to sleep in an enclosure. I, I get these photos from young lads that are in my asbestos group on Facebook and they, they'd be sacked if they showed some of these photos. So I say, send it to me, I'll show them because I use it and educate them. I want to educate people. And this is the worst one, is demolition time. I'm trying to get crowd control taken care of, I think. That, yeah. It 
it was a young lad took this for me, or uh, he took that for me, and he sent it to me, and I said, put it on YouTube, and I'll, I'll show it around. Um, because, and then, the, but the boss of the site got hold of me and said, if you don't get that off, I'll sue you. And I said, excuse me, but I think I'll sue you back. Because, I said, if you watch that film, then you'll see that it is ju um, there is fiberglass in there, and everything's going over that crowd. And he looked back and he looked it back and he phoned me back and he said, You're right. He said, Right, he said, from now on I'll get fiberglass out as well out of all the buildings. So that he did. And that, I mean that's the pile that they get left with. Then I'll go over the shop and Ray disappears. When I come back, he's not there. And he's over there with a skip. And I said, What are you doing over there? And he said, Come over here. And he said, Look, this is asbestos rope and that. All asbestos there. So I put it on Facebook and they, uh, a bloke got hold of me and said, put, find the name out on, on the skip. And he said, I'll phone. So he found, an, I, said, I gave him the name and he phoned and the bloke came round and he said, oh, he said, all right. He said, I'll get rid of that and I'll cover it. They don't realise what they're doing because there was a nursery right there and the wind's all blowing. And, but the actual workers themselves taking that down were not protected. And all right, so there were poor Polish boys come over and working cheap for him, and he hasn't protected his workers. So, you know, I, I just, you, you see it all the time, and you can keep on and on. <coughs> this was spotted. Uh, it's just a, a notice there made out of uh, fiberglass. Sorry, asbestos. I've got fiberglass. Asbestos, sorry. It can be anywhere. Beware where it. Beware when you're drilling where it is. Be aware of asbestos. It was hidden behind the boards. Hidden behind there. When they took that out, they saw that. It's just hidden. You have to be so careful what you're doing. And that's the size of the aspa um, asbestos fibres. So Twenty thousand in that little dot there on a penny. Where's you know. And this is a one that we see on Facebook a lot. But that man, there he is. He just needs educating. He wants a mask on. He needs educating. <laughs> education, education. And then when they dump it in the countryside and they even leave it on the trolley that they took it out there. You know, and they let, did that into a, a, a telephone box um, that was sent to me. Why dump it into a telephone box? What, what's in their mind? And this is on our, on our site, and they're <coughs> they've uh, laying new um, pathways and that. And there they is, grinding it, all that dust. Ray goes out and takes a photo, and he said, What's, what are you taking that photo for? And Ray said, well, we travel the country teaching people to wear masks. He said, and you're here behind us doing that, and, and you haven't told anyone to close their windows. And, well, all right, they don't talk to us now, but they wear masks. <laughs> you, you go, up, go on to that, go on, because that shows him. And, you know, they're just dumping asbestos anywhere. They're just not caring enough. So I went to Brunel University, and uh, they, they've got this telescope, or uh, microscope down there, and they uh, analyse asbestos as well. But they wanted me to help out with how to do a um, lessons on uh, asbestos within the college and the university. So we um, helped them do that, put together a, a, a lessons and all that so they can learn all about the asbestos. But they, it was used to be anywhere, all around generators and boilers. <coughs> Even a car. Why would you make an asbestos car? And so sort of we have to worry about all protection all the time in those days, but they never did. And so there's so many people suffering with mesothelioma now. And get a bit of board left over. What do you do? You make a bathroom cabinet. So all that, knock, you know, they've knocked it and donked it over the years. Don't care. They've, they've found these tiles. They're there on the, in the shop. Asbestos. Flower uh, plant pots used to be made out of it where they stuck them on the window sills. And this is a school. They went into a school and there it is stuck in a cupboard. And now we've got talcum powder. We're realising talcum powder has asbestos in because while you're mining talcum powder, you've got a, um, a seam of asbestos and they're not, they haven't cared about separating it out.
Now, eBay is a nasty place where you can buy it still, and they bought the mask, and then he looks through the, he had the filter looked at, and there it is, full of asbestos. So the, you know, the children go to museums, they try on the uh, masks out there, don't they, or the wartime lessons, and asbestos. It can be anywhere in the house, so be careful. I still say that houses should be surveyed. Uh, they need a survey, even if it was just at the point of sale, so that you knew exactly where all your asbestos is. Then it's up to you whether you take, keep, leave it in there or paid and have it taken out. We send our ships to be broken up. Poor people out there uh, in India or Pakistan, they're breaking up the uh, ships and they're no, not protected. Oh, well, that's what they call me, a missile warrior. <laughs> okay. Now, I see myself like that, <laughs> right? But the industry sees me like that. <laughs> so, in reality, it used to be uh, mattresses made out of it. And this is how they used to work. It was just no protection, just everywhere. Window sills, they found it on a window sill that photo was sent to me. It's <coughs> and the museums held um, these things. They've got asbestos in. But if people pick them up and start looking at them, you know, they'd be disturbing the asbestos. When the blitz, you don't, don't realise when you see all the bombing and all that, how that created um, the asbestos, because they then put them in to houses that were built of it. That, those prefabs were full of asbestos but nowadays they replace it with a nice new house. Which is what I'd like to say about you lot out there building these new buildings. You're actually doing a favour because you're getting rid of all the asbestos and the new buildings won't have it in, so they'll be safer. <coughs> so yes, I did start my, I launched my own foundation because I want to help doctors that are studying uh, in universities. And uh, at long last, I've managed to put together, um, we've got enough money to start uh, offering grants for um, pilot, um, I can't say, uh, pilot grants to, uh, if you've got an idea for mesothelioma and you, you want to put a pilot grant, we offer it. And the, the applications are just coming in now. So I'm really proud, and I've got, you know, he, all the doctors are all helping me. Yeah, we had a great launch. It was a really great night. And uh, Merck, uh, what, MSD, came th uh, there, and I was out actually able to thank the people that did save me with their new drug. And the Miso Warriors, they enjoyed themselves there as well. It's good to see them laugh, because the, some of these have lost their pe uh, partners. So yes, asbestos does kill, don't be fooled. It takes no prisoners, only loved ones. And so thank you for watching my journey. But, and I hope that I can educate, and I hope you go away and educate, that look after those lungs. <laughs>